Welcome to another episode of Ask an Ambassador with AOPA's ambassadors from California, Kay Sunrum, from Texas, Pat Brown, from Florida, Jamie Beckett. And of course, as always in the background, we have the fabulous Philip Johnson. He's coming to us, keeping all the internet wheels turning from his clandestine bunker at the base of Mount Rushmore. But today, instead of Kevin Cortez, we have the very able expertise of Eric Webb, who amazingly enough, this guy is so incredible. He's way up in northern Minnesota on vacation. He is bouncing this off a satellite that he built with a coffee can, two D-cell batteries, and a spool of fishing wire. It's incredible. I don't know how the guy does it, but he does it. Welcome to everybody. And tonight, we're going to talk about inexpensive aircraft because yeah there actually is such a thing uh, and pat and k we've all been involved in buying an aircraft at some point in our lives is that correct yes, we have yes we yes. have and and yes. somehow we made it fit into the budget is that fairly accurate yes uh, well you know I, i'm living in a tent right okay. now <laughs> on a city park but i got an airplane okay well let's start the discussion and of course as always you viewers, and it's all about you viewers. We're, we're just here because we have no place to go, frankly. <laughs> but write in questions on anything you want. And, of course, tonight we're on Facebook and Twitter and AOPA's YouTube Live or AOPA Live's YouTube channel. So if you've got messages, go ahead and send them in. We will interrupt whatever we're talking about to talk about what you want to talk about. But the first thing I was thinking we would chat about was, the cost of buying an airplane, and there is a somewhat true rumor that aircraft are expensive, but the truth is they can be shockingly inexpensive. I, I've told the story before. My first airplane was a Cessna 150 that I bought for $11,000, which was almost half of the asking price. Um, do you guys have any experience with just yourself or somebody else just buying an unbelievable deal, whether it came out of a barn or a uh, you know, something that's just a tie down queen sitting out there or just an owner that said, that's enough of that. I'm getting out. Go ahead, Kay. I'll defer well, I, to you. Well, you know, I wouldn't say an unbelievable deal, but when you compare the alternative, which is renting, it is an unbelievable deal for being an aircraft owner. There's just, uh, there's, there's no other way of saying it. It's when you own an aircraft and your operating costs are really what you're paying for and it's also an investment um, we know that aircraft can be appreciable assets and you know if you owned a 172 way back in say 20 years ago you could have probably sold it for maybe 60 70 thousand dollars now you know good luck trying to find something that's really nice that's Sixty, seventy thousand dollars in the one seventy two training market. So they are appreciable assets. So it really depends on one, how long you're going to hold on to it, and then two, uh, your utilization. Because renting from a flight school or even a flying club can be a lot more expensive than owning. So you got to figure out what that price point is and and how much you're going to use it. That's that's the I way agree. I look at it. Yeah, we had I, got a, I got a, I got a, I got a, I was just gonna say I've got a good friend that uh, was trying to build some time to go to work for the airlines, and he was about. I don't know, 400 hours or something like that short. And he found a Cessna 150. And and this is only about four years ago. And I want to say he bought it for about $18,000. Mm -hmm. And he flew that airplane from Texas, from Houston, out to the West Coast, all up and down the West Coast, visiting family and friends. Came back here, flew it for another 100 hours or so till he had his 1,500 hours. And he sold it for $2,000 more than he bought it for. Yeah, I've, I've owned seven airplanes in my life, and five of them I sold for more than I paid for them. And and not spectacularly, but I came out well. And by the way, we have Danny Carson here who says he has a Cessna 150. Congratulations, Danny. It's nice to have somebody with some personal experience on the line. I'll tell you, I did some research today because I'm a professional. Uh, I went online and I started searching around and not doing real hardcore searching, just, you know, hey, what's for sale out there? We have a co-worker, Jeff Rockwell, who's out in Texas, who owns a T-Craft. And he loves that T-Craft. He's had it for a long, long time. So I started looking up in the BC-12s. And by the way, BC has a Continental engine. BL has a Lycoming engine. But it's basically the same airplane. Um, you can get T-Craft for between... Twelve five and twenty thousand dollars listed today online. 
that's how that's a fun airplane it's actually in many ways better than a piper cub and it breaks my heart to say that <laughs> but it's, it's a faster airplane it it's got a big wing it doesn't use an enormous amount of fuel but it'll go 100 miles an hour but that's a classic case of what you were talking about pat where what's the mission of this plane is it to build up some time so i qualify for a job or is it just because my significant other and I just want an inexpensive plane to travel around the region. We're not going all the way to Kay's house. We might not even go all the way to Pat's house, but maybe we'd go up to Georgia or South Carolina or over to Alabama and, you know, fly down the keys. You're talking about a very inexpensive airplane to buy and to maintain. Yeah. I got another good friend, not very far from us here. Actually, we became friends through an AOPA Rusty pilot program and just stayed in touch because he's not very far from here in Houston and have become very, very good friends. And he bought an air coupe a couple of years ago. And I want to say he, I want to say it was about $15,000 for a classic air coupe with no rudders. I mean, it was one of the early models mm -hmm. and I want to say it was about 15 grand. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you watch, the, the, the market out there, trade a plane and barnstormers and some of the others that are out there, you, you really can find a, a decent used airplane for the price of a less than the price of a car. Well, I'll tell you, it, interesting that you mentioned air coupe because on barnstormers.com right at this very moment, there is an air coupe for $15,000 and there are two for nineteen five. That's, that's not a whole lot more than motorcycle money, frankly. That's right. So, Brian Barnett makes a really interesting point. And having owned a couple Cubs, I'm going to have to go along with him. The most expensive part of owning my Cub is the hanger. At about four and a half gallons per hour, it's hard to beat in smiles per gallon. And man, I, I can't agree more with that. One of the great things about those simple, fun, small displacement engine airplanes is it just doesn't cost very much to run them. And we'll talk about that in a minute beyond buying the airplane but maintaining it and costing of owning it, it really is pretty great. And Kay, you're, you right now are flying a fairly large displacement airplane, a Cirrus, but there must be people out your way who like people here. You know, you've got somebody with a little, a little plane, a Cub, a Champ, a T-Craft, something like that, that are just out, well, Joe Borzileri. He's always flying that Cub around with his foot stuck out the door. He seems to be having a good time. Well, there's a lot of uh, small airplanes here. I see a bunch of 152s in the in the training arena and the flying clubs out here, and uh, very very cost effective. Whether you're in the flying club or if you buy it and you have a couple of partners, um, I, I, I believe it was Brian's comment about the hangar. Yes, out here uh, I'm in Southern California. Hangars are very very expensive. This is all the more reason why you want to share some of those fixed. The fixed costs can sometimes be more than your operating costs for the month, uh, depending on the airplane that you have. And if you have a hangar out here, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna pay probably four digits at some, some airports. Mm. And so you really need to get a couple of like-minded people together to share. Then, then that thousand dollar hangar becomes 250 a person, right? If you got four people. And so that's, that's the way you, uh, you attack it. Yeah, and Pat, uh, Danny Carson's Danny Carson, sorry, Danny, has just come back and says the 150, and I think he meant it doesn't cost much to fly and the insurance is fairly reasonable. That's yeah. true, and we've got a kid at my local airport who's just selling his 150 now, the exact scenario you were talking about. He bought it to build time, and he jumps in it with his girlfriend. He flies all over the southeast and just builds up a bunch of time, and, and now he's selling it. And, you know, really over the, you've got an airplane built in the 60s or 70s, it's already depreciated all it's going to. So you can put three, 400 hours on it and basically get what you paid for it. It's, uh, it, I'm sorry, were you going to say something, Pat? No, no, I'm just agreeing. Okay. Um, one of the other interesting ones I found, there was a Mooney M10 Cadet, which is single seat Mooney, really cool, 20,900. And let me throw this out there. The asking price for an airplane, in my opinion, is very much like the asking price for a house. That's what they'd like to get. That doesn't mean that's what you have to offer. That first 150 I bought, the seller was asking 20. I offered 10. He countered with 11. I said, okay. You know, it, it's, it doesn't have to be a contentious arrangement. He just wanted to get rid of the airplane. He, he bought a house. He was having trouble affording both. He hadn't had another offer. So, Sometimes you can really come away with a really good deal 
just by being creative and saying, well, I love it. It's terrific. Say that in your head. Don't say that out loud to the seller. <laughs> and, but I can only afford this. Um, yeah, that's that's true. You know, you when you get into the the negotiation part of it, you know, you also want to be a little bit careful because if you if you go in too aggressively and you go too lowball, you know, you can offend the seller because let's face it, that's his or her baby, and uh, you know, the the seller has in mind what what they think it's worth, and let's just say they wanted twenty and you came in and offered ten, um, you've just insulted the seller. And it's, it may not be as amicable as, as it could be, uh, although you may be able to consummate the sale. I've actually told this story and written about it because I had that exact experience once. My first cub, there was a fellow on my field who was selling it, and he was asking 28. And I went and looked at it, and I offered him 18. And he screamed and yelled and called me. I mean, he really was offended. He was angry. And I was, hey, I'm not trying to insult you. You can sell it to 35, for 35 to somebody if you want. But if you've still got it a month from now, whatever, and you'll take 18, I'll buy it from you. Well, three days later, he called me back to say, would you still take 18? Because he was a novice buyer. He had bought the airplane and moved it to our field, but he was a student pilot. He had not gotten along with any of his instructors, and they wouldn't fly with him anymore. He never actually registered the airplane. And now his company was transferring him. So he had everything going against him. And whenever people found out, oh, and, and there was a lien on the airplane that had oh. never been dealt with. So it's like, I got a lawyer. I can deal with this. <laughs> yeah. But that's the kind of thing that I, I really wasn't trying to take advantage of the guy. I had $18,000 I could spend. And if you need to get rid of it, I'll buy it. It worked out great. And I had that airplane for quite a while. It was terrific. But yeah. sometimes you'll find an owner that is just simply uh, upgrading. You know, they say, hey, they have a 172. They want to get a 182 or 182 to 210 or whatever it is. And uh, they know that they can't move on to the next step until they get rid of their current airplane. And so those folks are, are, are oftentimes you know, willing to negotiate quite a bit, especially if they know that you really want the airplane and you're, it's going to go to a good buyer, someone who's going to take care of that airplane. Because a lot of pilots, owners, we're, uh, we are emotionally connected to our, to our airplane. It almost becomes part of the family, right, sometimes? Uh, we true. really care about it. And um, so if you could find a, a deal like that where you know someone who is upgrading uh, and you know they don't want to just put that airplane on the market and if you if it's going to be at the same home base then you might be able to get a good deal that way you know i, I get uh, i'm sorry go ahead Jamie. no no you i'm uh, I'm, I'm all oh. into you man <laughs> what i was going to say is that oftentimes i get asked you know, how, where do i start my search and almost always i'll say certainly you can go to trade a plane and you know all the other the, the, the normal suspects but why not if you're especially if you're if you're currently flying on your, on your local field start with a local maintenance shop that local maintenance shop may well know of an airplane that's right there on the field and uh maybe an owner that's that's just considering selling it maybe willing to take on a partner or two um, maybe willing to put it in a flying club or something along those lines. So maybe start local, talk with the local FBO, talk with the local maintenance shop or shops and see what they know. Keep it local yeah. if you can. Yeah, and actually along those lines, because Kay brought that up before about sharing costs. And Kay, this is right out of your neighborhood, the sun-soaked beaches in downtown area of San Diego. There is right now today online a Piper Tail Dragger half ownership for $89.50. That, that's not even $9,000. And you get into an airplane that could be an awful yeah. lot of fun. And, and that's one of the great parts, as you say, Kay, and we were going to segue into this later, but based on Pat's comment, I think we should accelerate the pace. <laughs> you know, there really are tremendous opportunities out there. You know, we're talking about these airplanes that are under $25,000. Well, if you find one other person to buy in with you, especially, you know, Pat's point from before, if you're time building, if you find one or two other people, you can cut your costs down really low. And the actual operation of an airplane doesn't have to be that high. I mean, it really is. I, I often say that speed is a function of discretionary income. Hmm. If, if you have an enormous amount of money you don't know what to do with, buy a large displacement airplane. You know, get a T6. Go ahead. That'll be great. Yeah. But if you're just trying to build time, there's nothing wrong with these small airplanes. And frankly, 
even though we fly a fair amount, I could share my airplane with two or three other people and yeah. not have a problem. And Pat, you do that, don't you? You you uh, you share a couple airplanes with the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I've got uh, I've got one a partnership where there's there's four of us in the airplane, another one where there's two of us in the airplane, and um, mm. you know I just uh, you know I I just I I I choose not to afford to I choose not to be a single owner. And the reason for that is that I wouldn't fly the airplane enough to justify all of the expenses that go along with it. And, you know, with a, with a couple of different partnerships, I get two great airplanes and a fraction of what it costs to own both. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a win-win. We've got a great comment here from Nicholas Zordon. I'm ready to partner with someone, but it seems exceedingly hard to find a plane and a partner. There's a lot of truth to that. And from my experience, it really is a matter of networking. You know, Pat, like you were talking about talk to the maintenance shop. It, you got to get out and talk to a whole bunch of people. And Kay, what do you think of this? It's kind of like when we talk about starting a flying club, somebody at some point has to write a check. If you really want to be in, a, in, in an airplane with multiple people, you might consider buying the airplane, then advertising the co-ownership slots, because now it's not a theoretical thing. Oh, I can come look at it. And, and I'll tell you, I've got a guy in town right now. Every time I start thinking about buying another airplane, I bump into him in a restaurant or something. He's like, hey, if you buy that, let me know. I'll, I'll jump in on it with you. What's your thought on that, Kay? Oh, I absolutely agree with you on that. The I think the hardest step, or well, not even so hard as the, the the biggest step is getting the airplane. Um, it, there is a, pr a process for that, and we AOPA will help every member, uh, you know, go through that. Con contact one of the three of us if you want some help with it. But uh, when you do that, then it shows that you have a lot of skin in the game and you're serious, and then people are more likely to say, hey, let me get involved. Um, but if you get 10 people, 20 people like, oh, we want to do this, and you just don't have the airplane, it's a lot of talk and talk and more talk and so the rubber has to hit the road at some point and that's when you somebody goes and writes that check and buys the airplane or a couple of people who know exactly what they want uh, they go together on the deal and they buy it but that is a very critical critical step yeah you gotta you gotta keep the working group small you really do i've, I've mm -hmm. had the same experiences the both of you have and the more people you get in i think we've talked about a paralysis by analysis and that's exactly what happens. And you got to be real careful about that. And we got a shout out just now from JJ Greenway. Uh, and uh, JJ's a good Got guy. It. He he, uh, he actually was responsible for for bringing me on board with AOPA as a safety seminar presenter. And gosh, look what happened! And me too. <laughs> JJ, you were the one. Yeah, he was one of my one of my early contacts at AOPA. Yeah, we've well, got one one other guy that said hello. Drew J just said said hello too. He's uh, he's working on a, getting a flying club started up in the Dallas area. So hey, no pressure, Drew, but you're in front of five thousand people right now who know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, let's try some specific recommendations for Nicola Zordon about this partnership. I'm going to say go on social media and, and even put a comment on this feed right here. Tell us where you are and what kind of plane you're get, looking to get into. Put a flyer up at the local airport, at the FBO, in the pilot's lounge. Start hanging around the, the airport restaurant and make it clear to people that I'm shopping for an airplane and I'd sure like it if I could find a partner or two to do that with. I think those are all good suggestions. Does anybody else have? I got a, I got a couple of other suggestions. So yeah. uh, find out what sort of um, meetings that your airport associations have. Most of the airports do have some sort of association. Some are more active than others. And I'll, I'll speak for my home base of Palomar Airport. Uh, they have a very, very active airport association where we, we do get together almost 11 out of the 12 months of the year. And uh, that, that's a great place to say, hey, I'm looking for an airplane. Do you, does anybody else uh, uh, know somebody else who is? And, and you'll be surprised to see how many matchmakers there are out there for airplanes. Yeah. Uh, the, the second is um, get really cozy with the, the trade organizations. So if you are, uh, whether it's the Cessna or Piper or Cirrus, they all have trade organizations. Yeah. And join them. And even if you're not an owner and they say it's, uh, like COPA, for example, Cirrus Owners Pilots Association. You don't have to be an owner, 
uh, I believe, what is it, 1% of pilots are owners? Is that correct? Or sorry, it's a pretty small number, I think. Yeah. It is a small percentage, but those organizations are great because they live and breathe that make uh, of aircraft. Yeah, and true. so if you're interested in a Piper, or particularly a Cessna or a Sears or whatever it is, then join those trade organizations and then get on their forums. And there's a lot of people saying, hey, I wanna, I'm going on this trip and um, looking for a ride or looking for an airplane partner. And so get involved with your airport and the trade organizations. I have found those two be, to be very helpful. That's a great point. And Lyle Cox is really preaching to the choir here saying, that's what he did. He bought a Cherokee 140, then sold three other shares in it eventually got his own price down to zero dollars and and that's a that's a doable thing because you made the initial investment you can bring in partners and now everything about that plane gets cheaper whether it's the hangar the maintenance the insurance everything gets split multiple ways and um nicola is saying she's in palm beach i'm sorry he i'm guessing it's a he is it is it he or she uh, you know, these days you got to ask people for their pronouns. So I honestly don't know. Nicola, you're in Palm Beach, Florida. I'm in Florida. My email is jamie.beckett at aopa.com. I don't know. No, .org. It's aopa.org. Um, write me. I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you. If, you know, if I can help you make this process easier, I'm happy to. Of course, you could call Pat or Kay because they're much nicer people, but I'm <laughs> geographically closer to you. But yeah, there's there's so many things to consider. And one caution I would say when you're shopping for an airplane and you've got the partners and then you're shopping, the Pat's point about the smaller the group, the easier it is. If you've got four people looking for an airplane, they all want a different panel. Maybe they're looking for a different engine. Maybe they want a different interior. It starts getting way more complicated. Where If you have the airplane, it's more of a question, do you want a piece of this? That, that simplifies it. How did you get into your um, two-person co-ownership, Pat? Was that the it's, plan existed or what was it, the deal? Well, it, it it was brought to our home airport. It's I, This is going to be the Reader's Digest version of the story. It was brought to our home airport and I had never, uh, I had actually, I'd never flown a Comanche before. I just thought I liked the way it looks and I want to, I want a part of this, this four-way partnership. And over time, the, the members um, evolved uh, to, uh, to what it was about a year ago. And then we had a guy leave and the three of us bought him out. And then we had another guy bought a Bonanza and two of us bought him out. So it just ended up being the two of us in the airplane. We just liked the way the, the economics worked for the two of us. And that's kind of the way it started. It started out as a four-way partnership with one guy, just like we talked about, deciding that he wanted to have a Comanche. So he, brought, he bought one in uh, the East Coast and brought it to Houston and three people joined in after he got it here. That's excellent. By the way, I want to go to two comments here. One from Nicola, who points out Nicola is a he. My deep apologies. My name is Jamie. I get a lot of email <laughs> to Ms. Beckett. So I, I feel your pain. It's okay. And Drew J is making an interesting point down here about looking for a lease back option for their flying club. And is there something that ALPA can do to connect clubs with interested owners? You know, there, we've had talk about that sort of thing, but I will tell you, nothing will be you getting out there and talking to people. You know, just I talk all the time in maximum fun, minimum cost seminars about the magical power of pizza. If your club invites people, and I'll tell you, you might find if you write up a, an email, that you're looking for somebody who might want to lease their aircraft to the flying club and send it to the airport managers in your area. They will be willing to share it with their tenants. They're not going to give you their mailing list, but you could find hundreds of people fairly quickly. All you need is one person to say yes. Kay, have you ever gone down that path where a club is looking for a leased aircraft and how they might find that? I have. Um, there are clubs that are always, uh, they're growing, right? Not all clubs are going to be one or two airplanes. Eventually, as you get more and more people and there's more utilization, they want to find more airplanes. And so I've had a number of people contact me uh, as you know the AOPA uh, ambassador in Southern California and say, hey, do you know other 
folks who would be interested in having uh, an airplane lease back, or we might even expand to another airport. And so um, we, I, I think I speak for, for, all, for all of us here, we are kind of matchmakers in that sense, because we know what's going on at, at a lot of the different airports in our, in our territory, and we'll try to connect people. So um, I think that's a great way to, to keep growing your flying club. We that have a club. I'm sorry, go ahead. So we have a club in Midlothian, Texas, which is just south of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. And uh, and they looked and looked and looked for an airplane. And there there came available on the field a Cardinal. And one of the members just said, you know something, I'm going to buy it. I'll put it in an LLC and I'll lease it back to the club. Mm -hmm. So one of the club members, as I said, bought the airplane, put it in an LLC created a, a, a lease back deal and they uh i i think they're up to seven maybe eight members now and uh, are doing great with this awesome cardinal that they found but one of the members stepped up and did it <clears throat> yeah that's that's one of the interesting things i helped a club form over on the east coast of florida once and they had the members and they had put their money in a pot and they were looking for an airplane and i had actually talked to them about the lease option because they had been trying to buy and they were having some challenges and they started interacting with the local EAA chapters. And in doing that and going to the hamburger lunches and the pancake breakfast and things, they found two people who had airplanes that they would be willing to lease. And lo and behold, they were already in hangars. So it solved two problems. We have an airplane that's affordable and we have a hangar. And I suspect it's the same where you are as where I am. Sometimes there's a very long waiting list for a hangar. So it solved two major problems at the same time. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about insurance because I grew up in the suburbs of Hartford, Connecticut, the insurance capital of the world. Everybody either made jet engines at Brett Whitney or they sold insurance. There's two things to consider in my mind when you're looking at insurance for an airplane. You've got liability and hull. Now liability is relatively inexpensive. When I had my air cam, the liability was like less than $800 a year, but the hull was over 6,000. So you can kind of make a decision. How much risk do I want to take? What do I want to consider here? And, um, you know, I know some flying clubs, high school flying clubs, where maintenance is part of their, their mission. They just have liability because if something happens to the airplane, fixing it is what we do. So they're just out parts. Pat, you've owned a number of airplanes. You've been a part. What's your thought on the insurance thing? Well, it's going up. I mean, I mean, I mean, we might as well address the elephant in the room. Uh, the same insurance underwriters, carriers that insure our types of airplanes also insure Boeing. And we all know what happened with the 737 MAX. They're also the same people that insure homes and cars. We also all know what happened with Hurricane Harvey. And uh, uh, my house had 18 inches of water in it. And it was just one of thousands. So um, the, the, the pool is the size of whatever the insurance pool is of people. Um, and billions and billions of dollars are being paid out in claims. So insurance rates are going up. We had a 10% interest in the Cirrus and, a, and a, about a 12% uh, in, in, excuse me, a 10% increase in the Cirrus premiums last year, about a 12% increase in the Comanche. And I was happy that that was all. So uh, it, it's still a very affordable. Again, it's divided by four of us or two of us. It's still very, very affordable. But uh, uh, you're go you may, and, 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 and age is another issue too. You know, as, as the pilot population ages out, uh, I've got a good friend who's 80 years old. You would never know what to look at him. You would never know. And he's, he, he, and he's an excellent pilot but he was forced out of his bonanza on this last renewal because they wanted something like $8,000 to insure him on his bonanza. The day, you know, he was, he was fine at 79, but the day he turned 80, all of a sudden he's incompetent. What certainly does, it doesn't make any sense, but that's the way they look at it. So now he's looking for a 182 or a 172 so that he can keep flying and he's perfectly capable of continuing to fly. So well, I don't know if I've answered your question, but but these are these are all things that, you know, all of us are going to face sooner or later, whether it's uh, insuring an airplane from scratch, whether it's renewing an airplane that we've had for a period of time. There's a there's a club that was forming. I, I, I won't mention which one, but there was a club that was forming recently that bought a 1947 V-tail Bonanza. 
and they had a heck of a time finding insurance on a 70 year old airplane. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, on good points. And by the way, JJ Greenway's back and I got to thank him. JJ is saying a huge shout out to AOPA. It's always been a national organization and had developed a reputation for being out of touch. There's some truth to that. But now they put their money where their mouth was. AOPA operates the National Aviation Community Center at the Frederick Municipal Airport. We refer to that as the NAC. And Kay brought this up a little while ago. I got to give a big tip of the hat to Mark Baker and Katie Pribble and all the folks that started this You Can Fly thing because we actually have people on the ground, coast to coast, who are a phone call or an email away. We'll even come visit mm -hmm. you. Our role really is to help facilitate your goals coming true, making it possible. And that's why we do ask an ambassador because Pat's a DPE, Kay is an aeronautical engineer, I'm an AMP, we're all flight instructors, and you know, we're happy to help wherever we can. JJ, I really appreciate that because AOPA does so much more than people think. It's not just okay. So Jamie has a little bit of an issue with his uh with his internet, it looks like here. So uh, let me see if I can pick up the slack here. Uh, yeah, we do a whole lot more than what people think. In fact, I saw a Facebook post the other day uh, that said, uh, it, you know, AOP is just for millionaires. And, and boy, that is just so not true. That is just so not true. Uh, we do a lot now for high schools too, which we, oh my gosh, which we yes. didn't have that program earlier. And boy, we have just come a long way with, uh, really getting kids involved yeah. and uh, bringing youth into aviation is our future generation That's exactly of pilots. Right. And uh, so we're, yeah, we've, we've, yeah, we're coming from many different angles from different yeah. age groups, different experience levels, different aircraft uh, owners and, um, yeah, it's last, nice. Nice last week, as a matter of fact, I gave I gave several introductory rides to uh, a number of high school students and, their, and some of their teachers. And I'll tell you what, uh, somebody was talking about smiles per gallon. Boy, I'll tell you what, you know, we just had kids grinning from ear to ear when we landed. So uh, between between the I mean, the You Can Fly program between uh, between the high school initiative and I think we have three hundred and one applications for high schools that are are wanting to use our uh, uh, ninth through 12th grade curriculum now right. uh, we have aopa's flight training uh, advantage application that has uh, that app that has just been developed that's a totally interactive and adaptive flight training tool that mm -hmm. cfis can use in the cockpit uh, nothing like it on the market um, the work that we do with flight schools, um, the rusty pilot uh, thing. I think we're, I heard today that we're getting close to our 10,000 10, rusty pilot, which is an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. So uh, I know and by that the way, rusty pilots is not just for rusty pilots. It's also for current pilots, student pilots. So yeah. uh, don't uh, be misled by the, the name Rusty. We're always learning, right? A good pilot is always learning. I just That's exactly to, right. To yeah, throw in, fact, that in, there. in fact, I think every time uh, every time I do a, 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 a an online webinar, um, and probably the same for UK, I, I'm looking at uh, anywhere from about thirty to fifty percent of the people there claim claim to be right. current. Uh, they say that they're current, and you know something that's just fine because we always there are always things that we can that we've forgotten. I mean, uh, there's things I forget. If I, I if I don't use something for a period of time, I have to go back and, and look at it. So uh, it's, it's, it's helpful to do that. You know, one of the things that we were going to be talking about, and I think Jamie's just popped back in again. Uh, we missed you while sorry, you were gone. There was a pizza guy at the door. I, had to go <laughs> I figured that, or either that or your insurance guy. And, uh, <laughs> Priorities. Yeah. Yeah, we were actually we were just about to segue into uh, into maintenance costs and things like that. You know, we had talked about the cost of ownership because uh, sometimes you you can afford to buy it, but you can't afford to own it. There's a lot of truth in that, but I've got to mm -hmm. give credit to Kay, who is a genius, and being an AMP, I'm, I'm very appreciative of this. Kay has done owner assisted annuals in the last couple of years. I do those periodically. You can save a boatload of money. Mm -hmm. Plus, learn an enormous amount about your aircraft by doing an owner-assisted annual. So if you can go remove all those inspection plates and take the interior out, and really as far as the AMP or IA will let you go with it, that's a great way to save some money. Okay, yeah. you, you, I've learned a lot from doing the owner-assisted annuals. And, you know, I've, I've always been the type who, you know, 
I love designing airplanes and flying them, but maintaining them was never my cup of tea, but I've always had tremendous respects for the mechanics. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's hard, especially when you don't do it on a regular basis. It's, it's a lot of things that you just don't, don't think about. But as you get in there in, in the owner uh, assisted annual and get your hands dirty, you're learning so much more about your, your airplanes. And um, it's not just about saving the, the cost on the, on the annual, but it's also, you become a better pilot. And I guarantee you, you're gonna operate that airplane much more uh, efficiently and um, engine Airplane. overhauls, right? Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, the longevity, you're gonna extend it just well, by it, knowing how the airplane operates and you'll, you'll be a better pilot. And yeah. every airplane has, every airplane type has its own idiosyncrasies, its own weaknesses, right. its own strengths, its own likely failures. By becoming more aware of that, especially when you're out traveling, using the airplane for what it's for, going to someplace, if you have an issue, you're not totally at the mercy of somebody who's, you know, I've never met you before. I don't know if this is a reputable shop or not. I need this fixed. If you have some knowledge, it really does help. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, when I'm when I'm landing, for example, ninety nine percent, ninety nine times out of a hundred, I use the entire runway just so I don't have to use the brakes. You yeah, know, they, they I, are I'm expensive a, to maintain. So I tell people that all the time. Using air pressure is free. I don't use brakes at all on the airplane. I'll I'll run it all the way out. By the way, before this scrolls down. I, I was when I was so rudely interrupted by the pizza guy. Really good pizza, though. You're going to be glad because I'll, I'll bring some <laughs> over. Robert and Xavier Betancourt Jr. was saying, "What about Icon at thirty-eight thousand or three hundred eighty-five thousand dollars? It is an expensive airplane, but it is a remarkable one. Have either of you flown the Icon? I have not. I have not, but I want to do my seaplane rating in it. It's uh, you should up. do it. It's an amazing plane. I absolutely yeah. love it. Let me ask Robert Xavier Betancourt Jr. a different question that will lead us to a new topic. What if you could get into an icon for $38,000? In a flying club where you had 10 people, you could actually get access to that airplane. And an icon is much like a Piper Cub or something like that. You're not flying to Wisconsin in this unless it's air venture. The reality is you're going to go fly for half an hour, an hour. You're going to have a great time. You're going to Which means you can have 10, 15 people sharing the cost on the same airplane. Um, that might be the ideal use for that, something that's perceived as a high-dollar toy. But it's actually a, a terrific airplane, and being composite, it, it doesn't have a problem with salt water. It runs a Rotax engine, and I'm telling you, it doesn't use much fuel. It's yeah. a very affordable airplane to run. It's all about how you look at it, Robert. If, if I absolutely needed to own it myself, yeah, I'm going to spend a lot of money. But if I loop Pat and Kay in, and we all bring three friends to the party, this just became a fairly affordable, really interesting airplane that we can enjoy for many, many years. In, the, in that case, the operational cost is dirt. Yeah, and the, the you know the the one thing that I hear over and over and over again when I'm doing Max Fun uh, Men Cost seminars as well. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the Flying Club seminars that all of us do from time to time. I hear, what about access to the airplane? And I and I usually use the analogy to getting a, a brand new toy at Christmas and you're going to play with it you're going to want to play with it eight hours a day every day for weeks <laughs> or days anyway but sooner or later it gets put in the closet and you'll bring it out periodically and then at some point it gets forgotten about well a similar dynamic happens when you've got a flying club or people sharing the airplane when it's kind of new everybody wants to fly it but then pretty soon you fall into a routine and life goes back to kind of normal and you'll find that even with i think we recommend between eight and 12 is kind of a the optimum number of air, of people to be sharing an airplane of course it depends on the mission of the airplane but eight mm -hmm. to 12 people and i don't you isn't there a flying club in your area jamie that has 25 or 30 people sharing a J3 or something? There, yeah. There's a couple of those in there. I know one club that has three aircraft, 150 members, so 50 people yeah. per airplane, yeah. and they fly to the Bahamas. They go away, and they have no booking problems. They're doing yeah, we've, fine. We've got a couple of clubs here in the Houston area that have 150 to 175 members. They have between 
four and eight airplanes, kind of depending on how many are on lease back at any given time. But again, because of a club of that size, what they found is about 30% of their members fly 80% of the time. It's not quite the 80-20 rule, but it's very close. By the way, Robert has written back saying he'd like to, and I assume he means get into the, the icon, even though there are no flying clubs or military flying clubs here in California. Oh, Robert, how wrong could you be? And I'm not insulting you, but that attractive young lady over there, Kay Sunrum, happens to be in California. And a big part of what she does is help people start flying clubs. She knows all of them. So please, if you look there where it says mm -hmm. Kay Sunrum, it's k.sunrum at aopa.org. Write her and tell her you want help. She'll give you a call. She'll write you. I'm telling you, if it's something you want to do, you can do it. And while Icon is based out there in California, they've got a training base here in Florida. Um, Janessa Duffy, their, their chief pilot, I don't even think that's her title. It's something even better than that. Uh, Executive Vice President of Everything Awesome at Icon. That's what Janessa does. <laughs> um, when, when Jay Leno did the Icon on, on Jay Leno's garage, Janessa flew with him. I would be happy to connect you all if you need to, but it's a great yeah. airplane. It's worth checking out. You now know, we, we had talked, we were talking about maintenance or if you, are you, are we getting ready to segue to something else? Cause I want you to say whatever you want to say, Pat. I, I really do. <laughs> well, I've been sitting here with this. Everybody knows what this, <laughs> what this is, but uh, you know, with regard to maintenance, if you look at part 43, but specifically Appendix A, Paragraph C, there's 31 things that you as an owner can do to that airplane that's legal as long as you're a certificated pilot, including things like changing the oil, changing tires and tubes, changing light, uh, you know, uh, position lights, landing lights, those kind of things. Let's say there's 31 things that you can do, and that helps to bring the cost of maintenance down. You should get some training if you haven't ever done those things before. We talk in our Rusty Pilots about the... Um, uh, you know, the, the intricacies of changing a tire. It's not just like pulling it off the, the rim on a car. You jack it up and pull it off the rim in a car. There's there's more things to it. But again, there's 31 things that a certificated pilot can do to his or her airplane and do it legally and sign it off and put it back in the air. Doing your own oil changes will save you a boatload of cash and you'll get to visually inspect the engine compartment. It It's great. Hey, before this scrolls away, we have John, unpronounceable German last name. My apologies, John. I'd love to start an experimental build at my school to get more students interested in aviation without breaking the bank. Where would you recommend starting when it comes to creating a program organization to manage the ownership of an aircraft and associated equipment? I'm not kidding, write to me. I will talk to you all day about this. I sit on the board of two high school flying clubs, very, very successful. The newer of the two is restoring a J3 Cub, which a benefactor bought and gave to them. And we've just been informed in the last week that someone is donating a flying um, Aranka to us. So yeah, if you put in the legwork, if you do the networking, if you form your, your club correctly so that your state is happy so that the irs is happy you would be surprised but people will actually help you um i actually and, and i have not shared this with Kay or pat because we we haven't talked in the last couple of days i just had a meeting with a, an event venue that wants to hold a fundraiser for one of the air for one of the student flying clubs with a goal of raising five figures these people are not aviation people. They're an event venue, but they say, hey, that's valuable. I like what's going on there. I want to help. So I'm not kidding. Write to me. Call AOPA and say, who's the guy in Florida? Can you give me his phone number? This is what we do. Helping people get started with something like that is what makes us happy. So seriously, call me. And you can do it. Absolutely, you can do it. You bet. Hey, Jamie, I want to say one more thing to John since he's working with. Well, uh, if you uh, have to, school. go ahead. It, it is an unpronounceable name, though. You got to admit. And I mean, I actually speak a bit of German, but I, I, I can't get anywhere near that. <laughs> well, John, with the unpronounceable German last name, I wanted to say that uh, make. Make sure you look at the AOPA High School Initiative uh, program on our website and see if some of these schools that, that you're talking, or if it's a school that is interested in building an aircraft, is also enrolled in our aviation STEM program. So it is from ninth to 12th grade, four different grade levels. And there's two pathways. One is for pilot, one is for drone. 
And we, we'd love to see uh, your school uh, participate in that. And you can have as little as five students enrolled. And the application deadline is May 31st. So it's coming up, won't take that much effort. So talk to your local school district and uh, get them to, uh, uh, to, to sign up because we already have, um, what, 200 schools, 36 states, 8,000 students enrolled in Something our like that, yeah. in our aviation uh, STEM program, and it is just starting off. So uh, it's a fabulous program. Take a look at it, AOPA High School Initiative, on our website. And one, just one little piece of trivia here, if it's the same John that I think is uh, it is, I did his private pilot check ride in a Super Cub. No way. Yeah. That's pretty cool. By the way, um, Robert has written back saying he's at Hemet Ryan, Charlie mm -hmm. Delta Foxtrot 5, where the Riverside County forbids flying clubs. I'm really going to encourage you to get in touch with Kay now. Please I'm not, do. I'm, I'm not familiar with that airport. If it's a private airport, they can prohibit flying clubs. If it's a publicly owned airport that has taken government money for taxiways, runways, buildings, anything, they don't have the option of forbidding them. They're actually required to allow them. You don't want to be argumentative, but I've dealt with a whole bunch of airports who were under the impression that they didn't allow flying clubs until you show them the airport compliance manual in chapter 10, subpart six, and they go, oh, I have to, thanks, come on in, we'll rent you a hangar. <laughs> and sometimes there's folks who simply don't know the difference between a flying club and a flight school and yeah. what individuals can and can't do. Yeah. So it's just a matter of, um, of, of education. Yeah, you so. know, that's absolutely true, Kay. I, I went and met with an airport manager once because I was dealing with some people at an airport who wanted to start a flying club. And just to be polite, I went and met with the airport manager. Nice guy. I really like him. To this day, we get along great. And he was, nope, nope, no flying clubs here. Not going to happen. We have flight schools. We have maintenance shops. I can't have them compete. And I explained to him, you know, diplomatically that, well, they don't compete. A flying club does a completely different thing than a flight school or maintenance shop. And by the way, you've had a flight club on your field for 50 years, and it's never been a problem. So, you know, it is just they, they function, and people aren't even aware of it. So right. you can absolutely do that. It's a, it's a big deal. And this is where we get into, you know, we started talking about owning an aircraft. Whether you're personally buying an inexpensive airplane to, to build time with, whether you find a partner, Kay and Pat and I, all buy into the same airplane so that we're paying a third of the cost for all the fun, or whether we get involved in a club scenario, there's a variety of opportunities to get into the access to an airplane where you really do get most, if not all, the benefits of ownership without the cost. And, you know, that, that club I had mentioned before, Pat, that's got 150 members and three aircraft, Right. Consider this about the affordability of this, where people always think aviation is expensive. It's $400 to buy in. It's $40 a month. And you pay the direct operating cost of the aircraft with no profit margin. It's really affordable. And you have the ability to take the airplane for days at a time. So you can go to the Bahamas or the Keys or grandma's house. If y'all are interested in doing this, and I'm especially talking to you, Robert, because of some of the things you've said here, you got to contact Kay. She's a smart cookie. She knows what she's talking about, and they actually give her money to help people. So <laughs> take her. Wait a minute! Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait! A minute. <laughs> they give her money. <laughs> Oh, well, you, you, you guys are not paid? You guys are not there's paid? A, is there a secret I'm not aware of? <laughs> By the way, I'm going to assume this is directed at you two because I'm just not good at it. But Steve Crawford says, Rusty Pilots is awesome. I, I think that's his emphasis, not mine. <laughs> I never let my AOPA membership lapse during my 25-year gap in flying. You know what? I think each one of us on this has been a Rusty Pilot and came yeah. back. And I just heard this morning... <laughs> We are coming very close to our 10,000th Rusty Pilot who's current. So thank you very much, Steve, for applauding the program. These two do a great job with it. We all present it, but they're actually good at it. <laughs> um, we've, used, uh, we've used contractors in the past when we were doing these live. And I'll tell you, I have a feeling by later this year, we'll be back to doing the live Rusty Pilots. And you got to see Kay and Pat present this. They do a great job. You actually have fun in a three-hour ground school session that is absolutely enjoyable. You learn some great things that you wouldn't just get out of a book. And as I say, almost 10,000 now, it works. Yeah. And the in-person Rusty Pilot uh, seminars, even though they're scheduled for three hours, they generally go for about 
five because of the social interactions yeah, before and chatting. after. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yes, and a lot, and we always host those when they are in person with a fly school or flying club because we want you to to go directly to a place where you can you know get a lesson and and knock off some of that rust and because we are not going to be your instructors just for the ground session but uh, that's why we always hook up with the fly school or flying club and it's it's amazing how people just connect and and that three hours turns into four or five yeah. uh, or there's a barbecue afterwards and it becomes a social social yeah. event so so it's please amazing. keep your eye out for those in-person ones they're they're coming back and they're a lot of fun it's amazing you know people start showing up an hour ahead of time even you know even before i'm set up and ready to actually start people just start showing up and they, they're milling around they're talking to each other they're exchanging you know aviation lies and war stories and things like that and uh, and then we do our our thing, which is usually around three hours and maybe some change, depending on how interactive the crowd is. But afterwards, it's the same thing, just like you said, Kay, even if it, even if there's not a barbecue or food involved, you know, people just kind of hang around and mill about and talk a little bit. And and uh, it has it's not unusual that I'll be done. I'll say my goodbye, shake a few hands. And there's still 20 or 30 people in the room just kind of, again, milling about and maybe exchanging phone numbers or something like that. It's, it's actually quite the quite the event. And what better place to find people who might potentially be interested in sharing the cost of an airplane with you because they've got that social interaction, they've got that networking, you're about to cut my costs. Yeah, yeah. let's do this. I mean, that's that starts the whole process. By the way, I want to talk about something a little esoteric because we, we talked about the icon, which is perceived as very expensive. I used to own an air cam, and, and an air cam is a fairly expensive uh, experimental airplane. I think the kit's $99,000. Um, I've seen them for two hundred and $250,000 with amphibious floats on them. But there's an interesting thing about the air cam. Mine was burning a little less than five gallons an hour total on a twin because it's not a plane built to go fast. It's just loafing along. But those Rotax engines just are very efficient. So I'd it's got gear reduction. So I'd be flying at 3,000, 3,200 RPM, not anywhere near 5,000, loafing along 60 miles an hour at 500 feet, having a great time. But if you were trying to build multi-time to get someplace, the cost of entry is high, but it maintains that value for when you sell it. The cost of operation is just dirt rather than buying a Cessna 310, for instance, I, I happen to find today, you can get a Cessna 310 for 59.5 today online, but you're gonna spend some money on fuel and maintenance. And, and uh, they're great airplanes, I like them. Or you could buy, Pat, you might be interested in this, a twin Comanche for 89.5. <laughs> I don't know what color the interior is, but it's a twin Comanche. <laughs> but in, in both cases, much less expensive than something like an AirCam. But if your point was to build a couple hundred hours of twin time fairly inexpensively, that actually might be a way to go. And, and my point with this is, if we start thinking of accessing airplanes creatively, whether I do it with co-owners, whether I do it with a club, whether I take the long view and like that kid building time here, he spends $25,000 buying the 150 and he flies the heck out of it for a year and sells it later for $26,000, really just paid for fuel and oil. Yeah. There are, there are ways you can get involved in aviation very affordably. And I'm going to steer back to the rusty pilot here because something you said, I just wanted to throw that in, but something you said, Pat, really caught my, my mind. And one of the things I found fascinating about the live ones, I've been getting airline pilots and charter pilots. I even had a test pilot in one because they haven't flown VFR in years and they want to take their family's flight. Kay, have you bumped into folks at your rusty pilots live that you thought, wow, I never expected to find them here. I have. I've I've seen pilots that have flown for. I had a gentleman who had flown for uh, fifty years, but he was rusty for a good chunk of the time and wanted to get back in. I've had military pilots who want to transition and just decide, oh, let me just take the rusty pilots. Let me see what you know what it's about, even though they haven't flown GA airplane per se, but um, a variety and and all experience levels too. I, I mentioned. Uh, earlier that Rusty Pilots is not just for Rusty pilots, it's for current right. pilots and for student pilots too, because a good pilot is 
always learning. And so uh, all age groups, all experience levels and uh, certification types. In fact, we have, we have uh, you know, gotten uh, communications from airline pilots who uh, want to get back to flying GA to the point where we are just about to release, uh, it'll be a webinar to start with, uh, something called Back to Your Roots. It's basically rusty pilot for airline pilots. And so we're, we're talking about a lot of those things that airline pilots have done for them for, from dispatch or for their first from their first officer or something like that. Uh, and, and things that, uh, you know, for example, what's class CDE and G airspace because they're usually operating. Yeah, they have out no of, idea. Yeah, mostly they're in the flight level. So, you know, they may not be they may not be aware of some of the nuances of flying class echo airspace, for example. So it's, it's some little things like that. But but uh, we just finished beta testing it not too long ago. And I suspect we'll start scheduling that before too much longer. So back to your roots. If any anybody out there listening in this vast audience that we're commanding here uh, is an airline pilot thinking about getting back to your roots, then just look look for that. Well, I'll tell you, we do a thing in that Rusty Pilots where we do a little bit of a social mixer just for a minute or two because when you're in the air, you're not really alone as long as you have a radio. And we encourage you to communicate with the people around you. I was up in Pensacola a couple of years ago and ran into a fellow who was really complimentary that he had been to a Rusty Pilot, not one I taught. It was it was out west. And he just raved about how terrific it was and, and how much he got out of it and how easy it made it for him to get back into GA. Well, he had flown for FedEx as a career, but prior to that, he was Blue Angel number one. Mm -hmm. And if somebody like that can get something out of this course, anybody can get something out of it. And can you imagine how cool an experience it is when you go to a Rusty <laughs> Pilot and you're like, I don't want him to find out I haven't flown in 15 years. And the guy next to you used to be a Blue Angel. <laughs> oh, I guess I'm in the right room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I just love this stuff. Well, hey, as, in addition to the Rusty Pilot series, I also wanted to mention there is the uh, Don't Get Rusty. And really? so that is every month, the second Thursday of every month at noon uh, Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, the flight training group, they, they do a great job. They have a different speaker every, every month and different topics. And that's also for current pilots and rusty pilots and so I, this audience is appropriate for this the next one is coming up on thursday and we're going to be talking about being tech savvy you're conference. doing that aren't you Kay? i am so right. uh it's a different uh, different guest speaker every month i know jamie you did you did one i think it was the last month or month before on fuel system i attended that and so uh that's another great series that you guys and gals should uh should put on your calendar second Thursday of every month. New yeah, for those of you that this is new to you, you can find a whole lot on the AOPA Live YouTube channel beyond AOPA Live. We we have during the COVID thing, we have really switched over to doing a lot of outreach through the internet. And I'll tell you, Pat is just great at it. So you should absolutely participate. You know, we're we're into this. This is just great. So I'm going to owe you a lot of money by the end of this seminar. <laughs> Well, you know, as long as you and I are chatting, Pat, and we're just down to the last couple minutes, what do you have to share about aircraft ownership that maybe was a surprise to you, pleasant or unpleasant, when you got into owning airplanes? Is there anything that you really just just caught you by surprise, good or bad, that oh, yeah. is worth passing on? Oh, yeah. So when I wrote that first check, and by the way, it was a 1974 Cessna 172 that had seen better days and I had a one quarter partnership in it for $7,500. That was, that was a stretch back in the yeah. mid nineties when I, when I first decided I wanted to be an owner and I wrote that check and I got the key and I took it home and I sat on the sofa for about 30 minutes looking at that key in my hand thinking, what in the world have I just done? <laughs> <laughs> and and I thought, oh my gosh, what if what if the engine, what if the this, what if the that? I'll never be able to afford this thing. And then I went out and I flew it for the first time when my name was on the title. And I remember putting it back in the and and it took actually it took about three months for that feeling to totally go away. But after that, I have not looked back. I haven't regretted a minute of it. And I've been partners in. I've counted them up the other day. I want to. I want to say about 14 airplanes in the last 25 years, 
And um, it's hard to be faithful to one airplane. You want them all. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but but uh, yeah, just be beware that for, for a little while you might think, oh, my gosh, what have I done? But that goes away. And then it's like, wow, why did I do this sooner? By the way, we've got a great comment from Brian Barnett. I couldn't agree more. The camaraderie around the hangars, so many friendly people I never let while being a renter. The difference between being an owner and a renter is worlds apart. Yeah. When you're an owner, even when you're, you know, I deal with high school flying clubs where these kids are, you know, ownership-like rights to an airplane, but there's 25 of them. They know they belong there. They are not interlopers on somebody else's property. They That's their hangar. That's their airplane. So, Kay, how about you? What have you learned out of ownership that you maybe didn't know? Wow. You know I, I, mean? I hate springing something on you. You know what? Oh. Let, let me do this because we had a question earlier, and, and I'm sorry I didn't get to it. A woman was looking for her grandfather's airplane, and is there anything that helps her find that? You've actually tracked that down. Did you use the FAA aircraft registry to look up the end number, or how did you go about it? I did. So I was looking up the aircraft that my father had bought. It was a 172 back in the the in the 80s, and that's what I had I had trained in. I was a kid, and and I thought it'd be pretty cool to uh, to buy that, and I, I might still do that. Uh, and so I went to the FAA registry, and then found that, and looked on. Um, Fly to where and just uh, tr track it down to it's down your neck of the woods, uh, Jamie, in in Florida. So if you're looking for a particular airplane, that's a good place to start. So with regard to the FAA registry, just to be uh, clear, that's FAA.gov, yes. and right there on the home page it says search in numbers. Yep. So if you do yes. it on the way, if you do it on a on a laptop, it's right there. If you do it on a on a on a handheld device, you have to scroll down kind of towards the bottom, but it'll say search in numbers and, and just put the in number in there, including the in, yep. and it'll tell you who the current or current owner is. And just be sure that you go to the FAA site. If you Google it, you'll come up with a number right. of sites that look like the FAA, but they may charge you. This is yeah. a free search. The information's yeah. absolutely free. Yeah. Well, folks, I gotta tell you. The hour flew by, as it always does, sparkling conversation with Pat and Kay. I just love it. Thanks for participating. And thanks for letting me take a short break in the middle because I was getting winded. I hope you enjoy <laughs> that pizza, Jamie. We haven't, we haven't eaten yet. <laughs> well, to all you who participated tonight, had questions, thanks so much. We really appreciate the breadth of the questions all over the map. Absolutely great. We'll be back here May 25th, which is the fourth Tuesday of the month. Second and fourth Tuesday, we're here. Seven o'clock Eastern, four o'clock Pacific. So, okay, still got plenty of daylight left. Come back and see us. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, or AOPA Live's YouTube channel. We'll see you next time. Until then, have a great night. See you later. <laughs>